I am very excited to introduce Dr. Christopher West, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Alberta. He received his PhD in paleobotany and geology from the University of Saskatchewan, and he was recently awarded the Governor General's gold medal for his work on fossil plants from Ellesmere and Axel Heiberg. Is it Heiberg? I pronounce yep. it right? Good. <laughs> uh, islands in the Canadian high Arctic. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Christopher, uh, and you can take it away. Thanks, Cassidy. I'll just share my screen here. All right, um, as Cassidy said in, my, in the introduction there, I'm, I'm a paleobotanist. And what that means is I study fossil plants and not just to uh, find out more about their evolutionary histories, but what they can tell us about ancient ecosystems. So I, I chose the title of my talk pretty deliberately here, um, exploring the 56 million year old fossil forests of the Canadian high Arctic, primarily because by, by the time I finish my talk to you tonight, I, I hope it feels like I've taken you through a, a little bit of a nature walk uh, in these ancient ecosystems. So one of the first things we have to do is, is just sort of think about where the, uh, the Canadian high Arctic, I'm, where in the Canadian high Arctic do I mean? And of course that is Ellesmere Island way up here. This is Edmonton down here, and that's actually where, where I'm sitting right now. Um, so it's a bit of a distance. And if we zoom into that, we can see here Ellesmere Island and to the west of that Axel Heiberg Island. And these are about as far north as you can go in Canada. Here's our 80 degree latitude north line. Um, and they're really magnificent places. Uh, this star here is uh, Resolute, which is the town there on Cornwallis Island. And that's where you fly in to uh, initially start conducting your research. And what that looks like is you have these very brightly painted research buildings. I was in the Martin Bergman complex. And this is where you stage your research. This is where you put together all of your logistical support. And ultimately that culminates in you flying a twin otter plane uh, out to the island and landing on the tundra. You ditch all of your gear out and you set up camp and your camps are typically just a small number of tents. Here's a cooking tent right out there on the tundra. And when you're up there on these islands, you're treated to these beautiful sweeping vistas that are desolate, but really just something to behold. And if you're there at the right time of the year, you can also witness the tundra blooming into these beautiful pink and white flowers that just pop up everywhere. And of course, you have the opportunity to see a lot of really different and exciting wildlife. There are plenty of muskox wandering around up there, as well as Arctic wolves and other animals. And sometimes you might get both wildlife and beautiful landscapes together. Here are some muskox just feeding on the tundra. So when most people think about the Arctic, they think about a landscape that looks like this. It's frozen over, there's snow, the surrounding open water is completely iced over, and it just looks barren, frigid, and uninviting. Today, though, we're going to talk about a time in Earth history when the Canadian Arctic probably looked a lot more like this. And this is a river uh, running through the Everglades in, in northern Florida. And as you can see, this, this looks to be a warm, inviting, temperate environment that is heavily forested and just lush and very pleasant looking. And of course, it's quite a bit different uh, than the previous image I showed you, which is a, an aerial photo of Ellesmere Island today. So when was this? Well, this was uh, at a time in Earth history uh, known as the Eocene Epoch. And when was the Eocene? Well, here we have a simplified uh, geological uh, age diagram down here. And I put some uh, familiar indicators here. So of course, in the late Cretaceous, we know there were dinosaurs and that was put, a, put to an abrupt end right around 66 million years ago. And following that, we exited the Mesozoic and went right into the Cenozoic. And within that, we have the Paleogene. 
And about 10 million years after the end of the dinosaurs, we have the Eocene epoch. And with the end of the dinosaurs, that allowed uh, a lot of environmental niche space to open up, which permitted the, the rise of mammals, as we tend to think about it, but also the rise of the flowering plants, so angiosperms. Um, and those are the types of plants we're going to be primarily, look, primarily looking at tonight. So if we return to this uh, paleogeographic reconstruction um, of the Eocene epoch, we can notice a few different things about the continental positions. Although they are, for the most part, exactly where we would expect them to be today, there, there are some clear differences. One, Australia has only recently broken away from the Antarctic. The Indian subcontinent is only just starting to collide with Eurasia, so the Himalaya mountains are actually quite uh, sh shallow at this point. Most of Western Europe is underwater to some extent, as is most of the margins of Africa, and there's a large interior sea in South America. And of course, here we have North America, which if you look closely, and it might be a little small, there, there is to, uh, a number of mountain change from, chains from the western part of the continent that are, no, are not there currently that we would expect to be. If we zoom on, in on that a little bit closer, looking again at North America, uh, we can again see that parts of the continental mass are underwater. Um, so one of the reasons for that is, of course, that there were no ice caps in the early Eocene. And the early Eocene was considerably warmer than the Earth is today. And we know this from oxygen isotopes that have been recovered from marine sediment cores. And this is a curve here that tracks those oxygen isotopes backwards through time all the way to the beginning of the Paleocene, which is the epoch that immediately followed the end of the dinosaurs. And this cur curve here roughly equates to air temperature. And as we can see, as we go forward in time, it gets progressively cooler. Well, here's the Eocene again. And we're going to be focusing on this little box here, which is the early Eocene. And if you look at this curve, there are some sudden and immediate spikes. And these are what are known as hypothermal events. We have another one here in the middle Eocene, and we don't really ever see them again as we move forward. But what these hypothermals are, are very short transient events of intense global warming that occurred over very uh, short geological time, so 20,000 years roughly, which in geological terms is the blink of an eye. Um, and these can be considered analogous to modern warming that the Earth is experiencing right now. As a result of these warmer temperatures and these disruptions to Earth's climate, uh, much of North America was a tropical or subtropical forest. In fact, much of the world was heavily forested, and it was warm enough that our, uh, the Arctic was able to stay, sustain crocodiles living uh, that far north. And of course, as part of the Eocene, there were a lot of strange and interesting animals that were alive. And uh, a fair amount of vertebrate paleontology in the Canadian Arctic has been done. So we have a good idea of the types of animals that were living in the early Eocene in the Canadian Arctic. Uh, an excellent example here is this Corypidon which is an extinct animal and it belongs to an extinct line known as pantodonts. And this particular pantodont is believed to have functioned in, in an ecosystem the same way a hippo does, probably living in a very wet environment, uh, potentially submerged most of the time. There's also been fossil evidence found for tapirs. And of course, tapirs in the modern world live in South America and Southeast Asia. Um, and although they would not have looked as similar to a modern tapir, they have a lot of the right uh, skeletal structure that connects them. We also have fossil evidence for alligator gars, an animal that is still alive today, a variety of different crocodilians. Over here, we have a vulpavis, which is looks to be like a feline animal, but actually traces uh, a lineage towards modern foxes. And beyond these, we also have ample fossil evidence for tortoises, snakes, lemurs and other early primates, as well as terror birds. And terror birds are these large bipedal birds that were sometimes carnivorous, sometimes herbivorous, that 
occupied a lot of space that was left over uh, when the dinosaurs died out. Um, now, the only evidence from the Arctic we have of these are some fossilized footprints. Uh, so we don't have the conclusive uh, uh, bone evidence that we'd like to have yet, but people are now still looking for those animals. As a result of the amount of paleontology that's been done, there have been a number of uh, reconstructions of these environments done before. And this is one from the American Museum of Natural History. It's a, it's a diorama. And here's our friend, the Corypidon. There's our tapir, and there's that Vulpavis up there, that fox animal. And what's interesting about this is that it indicates to you a, a warm and inviting environment. And when I first started researching the Canadian Arctic uh, in the e Eocene, I looked at this reconstruction and I asked myself, well, how close is this to what, we, what the fossils are telling us? How accurate is this? And it's from these simple questions that I moved forward and began to uh, investigate the fossil remains of the forest itself. So how do we reconstruct a forest in deep time? Well, modern forests are a mixture of a lot of different factors, but only so much can be represented uh, from the fossil record and from fossil taxa. So typically we have three primary prongs that we paleobotanists use to reconstruct a forest in deep time. There's the composition, so the different types of plants that make up that forest, the climate, uh, and this has by and large determines what types of plants can live in that forest. And then of course, the diversity of the forest, how many of a certain type of plant relative to one another. Um, so today I'm gonna start with composition. What, what types of plants make up this forest? Now, the fossils of Ellesmere Island and nearby Axel Heiberg Island were actually discovered in the 1870s um, uh, on an expedition financed by the Swiss naturalist Oswald Heer. Now, these fossils were referred to in a number of publications that uh, Heer wrote, but they, they were never formally described. Um, and over the years, there were other um, publications about these, these uh, fossil plants. But again, they, they were lacking descriptions. And that was the principal thrust of my research. So in 2019, I published a monograph where I described 83 total fossil taxa. Um, and there was a considerable breakdown of angiosperms, which are your flowering plants, which also include monocots, which are, if you think of grasses, those are monocots. A dicot would be, say, like an apple tree. There were 10 different types of gymnosperms. And of course, polypodiopsida, which are ferns. But let's not worry too much about this. Let's actually look at some of the fossils themselves. So from here on out, I'm going to be showing you some of the more common fossils, as well as some of their modern equivalents, to give you a real sense of what types of plants were living in this forest. So if you were lucky enough to get up to the Arctic and uh, go on a fossil collecting expedition, the most common fossil you would run into is Metasequoia occidentalis. And Metasequoia, also known as the Dawn Redwood, is a plant that has very deep roots. We find this, this uh, conifer going all the way back into the late Cretaceous, and it still has uh, a living species today. Its natural range is, a, is only found in certain parts of China, but they're actually grown all over the world as sort of decorative plants. This is one I took a picture of outside of the University College Dublin in Dublin, Ireland. And as you can see, it's growing quite happily at the margin of this man-made lake. And if you look, you can see there has not actually been much morphological change between the foliage 56 million years ago and that of a few years ago. And here we have the female and male cones. So these are the reproductive parts of this particular conifer. You would also likely encounter uh, Glyptostrobus nor nordenskoldii, which is, again, a, a conifer that has a modern living relative, so Glyptostrobus pensilis, which is, again, uh, known as the Chinese swamp cypress and found only in parts of Asia today naturally, and has similar foliage to the metasequoia, but a few smaller differences with the leaflets along this, uh, this uh, leaflet here being much more closely oppressed. And again, we have cones of the female and male variety, and here are some modern equivalents. And both Glyptostrobus 
and, and metasequoia were deciduous conifers. So every year they would drop their foliage. And this is likely why we find such an abundance of it in the Arctic. We also have fossil evidence for the maidenhair tree, uh, known probably most famously today as ginkgo biloba. So here are some examples from the Cretaceous Garden at the Royal Turrell Museum in Drumheller. And here are some from Berkeley uh, from some other ginkgo experiments. So this is a tree that again has very deep fossil roots, uh, but is still alive today in natural populations only uh, in parts of Asia. So we're already getting a sense that there are a number of uh, floral elements existing in North America in the early Eocene that now are only found in parts of Asia. And much like Metasequoia and Glyptostrobus, uh, ginkgo was a decidu is a deciduous tree and it too would have dropped its leaves every year. Uh, moving into sort of our broadleaf trees, so now we're stepping away from the gymnosperms into the angiosperms, the next most common uh, leaf type you would find is the Katsura tree. Now, again, this is a fossil element that has modern relatives. Uh, Katsuras are found in, in natural populations in parts of China and Japan, but again, are grown across the world as decorative plants. Uh, they really thrive in temperate settings. And once again, if we look at the fossil leaf here, and this is, this is one from Ellesmere Island, uh, the actual morphology of these leaves has not changed considerably uh, over the intervening 56 million years. Now, the fossil name down here, Trochodendroides, this is a form genus. And what that means is we're, we're saying it looks very much like this leaf, but we're not willing to go so far to actually give it the modern name. And that's primarily because we haven't found any of the reproductive parts of this plant yet. We haven't found any flowers or seeds in the Arctic that tell us this is definitely this. Uh, but it's close enough that we're willing to uh, give it some form name that relates to that. The Arctic also had a population of grapes. And very likely, these were considerably different than what we would find today. But once again, looking at the morphology of the leaves, we can tell that there are a lot of similarities between a modern wild grape, something that you might find growing in Oregon or Washington in the forests, um, to what we find in the Canadian Arctic 56 million years ago. Hazel trees were also a large part of the Arctic forest. And hazel trees are most famous today for producing hazelnuts, which form the constituent components of such delicious treats like Nutella. And again here, we have some differences in leaf size and leaf shape, but by and large, all of the morphological elements here, such as the venation and the way the teeth are, are uh, constructed, really tell us how closely aligned the fossil form is to the modern form. Alder trees were also present in these Arctic forests. Um, and alders are interesting in that they have these highly specialized uh, catkins that end up looking quite a bit like cones, the cones you might find on a conifer. Uh, and we find both the leaves and the, the catkin cones of the alder tree up on Ellesmere Island. The Arctic was just filled with elm trees. There are Elm leaves probably make up the third or fourth most common type of fossil plant you would find if you were to be uh, looking for fossils up in these sediments on the island. And again, we have here what is slippery elm, which is found uh, largely along the eastern coast of uh, North America. And we can see a lot of morphological similarities. Uh, we do have some small scattered evidence for the reproductive parts of the elm tree, the seeds and the small flowers. Uh, but they're poorly preserved, so we're, we're still fence-sitting a little bit. But uh, Almus almifolia is the fossil name that we give to this particular variety. There is also horse chestnuts in the Arctic forests. And you can actually find a horse chestnut tree here in Edmonton. Uh, this is on Jasper Avenue. There's also one at the faculty club on university grounds. Um, and these are interesting trees because the leaves themselves are this this large palmate pinnate uh, structure. And these are actually what we call leaflets. They're not true leaves in themselves. The whole, whole uh, collection here is one leaf. 
We never find them all together in the fossil record up on Ellesmere Island, but we've come close. So this one here was probably connected to this one at one point. Here's a beautiful specimen, and we can really see just how close they are. These forests also had hawthorns, um, quite a variety of hawthorns, but this is one of the most beautiful ones that we have. Um, and once again, here is a modern variety of hawthorn, and just the similarity between the modern plant and the fossil plant is really striking. And it just really tells you, even though at the time of the Eocene, the continents were not quite right, the animals were still quite a bit strange, the plants were already fairly modern. Uh, if you were to go walking through this forest, there would be a lot of elements that you would immediately recognize just from growing up uh, in the mid latitudes in Canada or the northern United States. The forest also had some interesting extinct uh, fossil plants that are no longer around today. This is a large leaf of what we call Maginatea. And Maginatea is related to modern sycamores or plane trees. So this is one from the mid latitudes of the Paleocene. Um, you can actually find ones like this in Alberta occasionally. And here are some modern uh, plane tree leaves that are from growing in Vancouver near the aquarium. And you can really see the morphological similarities, but again, how different they are. They're not quite as dissected along these large lobes here. Uh, and the venation is a little bit different. This is not big enough to see that, but uh, the similarities are as many as the differences are. But this just gives you another indication that uh, these forests were not all together uh, truly modern in that sense. And then we have a number of plants that we're just not really sure. So this one here, which is uh, called Inserte setis, and that's just a term we use when we go, when we want to say we're not really sure where it goes. Um, this does not have a name as of yet. We're still working on that, uh, but it is a very unique and interesting leaf. It's cut off a little bit here, but there are other examples that have this very strange shape and venation pattern. This one here, Archaeum pellis, is uh, related to those Katsura trees, but it actually looks quite a bit like a mixture of a maple or a grape leaf. So it too is quite strange. And then we have Usha, which is a ubiquitous plant that was found all over the world in the northern latitudes, uh, so the boreal latitudes and further north but we're, we're not sure at all where it falls taxonomically. It's often referred to as the Arctic oak or the Kamishin oak, as it was originally described and named from a uh, place in Russia called Kamishin. But we actually have no real evidence that these might be related to oaks or beaches uh, or anything like that. We're just not sure what they are. And finally, we have more than just leaves and, and, and the conifer elephants I talked about initially. These are some early flowers that we find up in the uh, Eocene sediments in the Canadian High Arctic. Uh, these are some seed pods here that still have the little seeds in them. We have these large fruits here. So these, these bars here are centimeter scale, so you can actually see how big this is. And this has the look of a, a peach or an avocado. So finding a stone fruit that far back is actually quite exciting. And of course, we have equisetum, which is a plant still alive today, sometimes called puzzle grass. And it looks quite a bit like this. And you can often find it uh, in some of the forests here in Alberta, especially near the mountains. And we have a variety of ferns. This is coneopterus. And here is osmunda also known as the royal fern, as it's still alive today as well. And we have monocots. I haven't spoken a lot about monocots because they were not a dominating presence uh, yet by the Eocene. They really come into their own by the Miocene. That's when we have the rise of grasslands. But we have these large leaved monocots found at many localities in the Arctic that are likely related to what we call a traveler's palm. And a traveler's palm is not a true palm. It's in the Strelitziaceae family. So this includes the bird, bird of paradise flowers. But the, the leaves themselves are very reminiscent of those we find in the Eocene. And finally, we have Nalumbo. And Nalumbo is the lotus plant, which as we know is the 
famous for having these large lily pads that grow on the surface of the water. Um, and of course, there are many other parts of the flora that I, I really just don't have time to go through in complete detail. That in itself is at least one or two talks. But these are the most common plants that you would find yourself running into as you were collecting fossils uh, in the deposits up north. And if we go back to that reconstruction, we can actually see a lot of these elements already present. Here are some metasequoia trees. There's probably some glyptostrobus back there somewhere. We have some broadleaf trees here. Of course, here are those lotus leaves. Um, it's all fairly uh, as we would expect based on what we knew of the flora at the time. Uh, and although my descriptions did indicate some new additions to what was thought to be up there, the current reconstructions were actually already pretty close. And I was quite happy with that. But when we look at this reconstruction, it also looks quite warm and wet and very inviting and temperate. And that led me to my next question. Well, what do the plants tell us about the climate of the early Eocene in the Arctic? And that's our next step. So how do we use fossil plants to reconstruct climate in deep time, in geological time? Well, we take advantage of a relationship that is still in operation today. So here is a koppen geigen climate uh, map, which sort of outlines all the different types of climates found on the globe today. And here is a biome map, which outlines all the different biomes currently found on uh, the continents all across the globe. And if you look, there's already quite an amount of correlation you can do here. These are boreal climates, and they res uh, relate to the boreal forest. Here is a desert up here in northern Africa, and of course, this is a desert climate. So climates determine where certain types of plants can grow, and conversely, those plants can tell us what that climate was like. And how we do this typically is we use what we call physiognomy, and that is really just a fancy word for uh, the morphological or outward appearance of something. So what's interesting about the broadleaf trees, so the, the dicots, the angiosperm, your flowering trees, is that if you were to take two trees of the same type, let's say two birch trees, and you were to grow them under similar conditions on opposite side of the globe, so similar temperature, similar amounts of precipitation, similar amounts of humidity, those two trees, despite being world apart, would actually produce similar looking leaves. And we can take measurements of modern leaves and use that to reconstruct climate. And the features were kind of important to us are the apex, so the tip of the leaf, the marginal teeth, the base of the leaf, as well as the size and the shape of the leaf. So we have a number of principal methods that we employ. Uh, the most basic are univariate, which means they have one variable to spit out another variable. Uh, and those are leaf margin analysis and leaf area analysis. And in its simplest form, what this is, is we have large data sets of modern forests with associated climate data. In this cloud of data, all of these plants have been measured for uh, the percentage of leaves in those floras that do not have the marginal teeth, so they are untoothed. Uh, think about uh, leaves from tropical areas, they typically don't have teeth. And what this equates to is the more leaves you have in an assemblage without teeth, the warmer it is. And with leaf area, this relates to precipitation or how wet it is. And again, very simply, we have modern data, so modern floral assemblages associated with their modern climate data, and what this tells us is that the larger the average area of leaves in an assemblage, the wetter it is, all right? So we can use this and make those same measurements on a fossil plant assemblage and reconstruct temperature and precipitation. We can also use multivariate methods, which rely on multiple characteristics to produce multiple climate values, such as CLAMP. So CLAMP is the Climate Leaf Analysis Multivariate Program. And what we have here is we look at 31 different characters to produce anywhere between 11 and 15 climate values. Um, and those can include uh, temperature, 
temperature of the warmest months, temperature of the coldest months, growing season length, growing season precipitation, the three driest months, three wettest months, and humidity. And that data is collected again from modern data sets of plants and their associated climate data based on a whole suite of different characters, whether the leaves are lobed, how they're toothed, how they're shaped, and what their tips and bases look like. In addition to those uh, morphological or physiognomic proxies, we can also use nearest living relative analysis. And essentially what this is, is we associate modern plants to the fossil plants. And we take the climate envelope of those modern plants, uh, and we statistically look at all of those different climate envelopes and find the highest probability uh, a cli of the climate variable that all of those modern plants can live in. So for example here, here's a mean annual temperature analysis, and we have a whole suite of modern plants here, and the highest probable temperature that all of these modern plants can live under is around 12 degrees Celsius mean annual. And again, this, this can be used to reconstruct a fossil climate when we associate those uh, modern plants to the fossil taxa. Of course, this has the error in that if you misidentify a fossil plant, then the modern relative you assign to it won't be correct either. But I like to use all of these methods because I find this actually limits the amount of bias or error that can go into an analysis. So when, we, when I ran all of those analyses, I was able to fairly reliably reconstruct uh, the temperature from uh, the climate of the forests from plants, uh, which aligns quite closely to nearby temperature and precipitation reconstructions from marine core data. So the plants were telling us that the mean annual temperature ranged between eight and 13 degrees Celsius. The warm month mean temperature, so the warmest months, was typically 20 degrees Celsius or above. And the cold month mean temperature, so the colder months, was usually above zero, so a non-freezing environment. Relative humidity was around 80%. And a mean annual precipitation, so the amount of precipitation across a year, was between 150 and 200 centimeters per year. And the growing season precipitation was 100 centimeters. Now, a feature of the Arctic in the Eocene, much like today, would have been 24 hours of polar night and 24 hours of, of day during the polar summer. So the growing season precipitation can roughly be equated to the polar summer. And if we were to take that away from the mean annual precipitation, we end up with a, a rough approximation of winter precipitation between you know, 50 and 100 centimeters per year. And this tells us that the precipitation regime in the Arctic was not very seasonal. It was fairly well distributed. And finally, we also have the length of the growing season, which was estimated to be between seven and eight months. When we look at all of this climate data, we can actually think about what kind of modern environment is this most like? Well, these values are very similar to say the Everglades in Northern Florida, as well as the temperate uh, rainforests of British Columbia. So that gives you uh, a rough analog to think about when you're trying to imagine what these forests would have felt like in terms of their climate. Now we can take this one step further and we can plot that climate data on what is called a Whitaker biome diagram. And this is a simple diagram of mean annual precipitation uh, along the y-axis here and mean annual temperature along the x-axis. Um, and when you do that, you can actually figure out the type of biome uh, for a specific geographic location. So right here is Edmonton, and I think everybody can agree that Edmonton more or less is considered a grassland, and that's how it plots. Over here we have some forests in BC, and up here is Gainesville, Florida. So these blue dots are a series of Arctic fossil plant localities, and when we plant all that climate data, we see that they actually plot as just about borderline as a temperate rainforest, uh, but typically are functioning as a temperate forest. And here are these green dots. These are some uh, early Eocene sites from British Columbia. So we can actually see that the Arctic forests were acting as a temperate biome similar to the early Eocene forests from British Columbia. And this is quite interesting, and we'll look at this again a little bit later. So now that we've thought about the climate a bit, what about diversity? How many of each type of plant were there relative to one another? Was it fairly homogeneous or was it quite a broad mixture of plants that 
really varied over space and, and time. Well, one of the simplest metrics we use to assess diversity through fossils is counting them. And what we do is a census collection. And what that means is we count every fossil that we're able to accurately identify. And this provides us typically a very unbiased uh, look at the number of fossils and what that means for the diversity of them. So to do that, of course, you have to go to the Arctic. And uh, I've already shown some pictures from my time in the Arctic. And this is uh, that same plane I showed earlier. So in 2017, I flew up to the Arctic and I went to a spot called Stenkel Fjord. So here's Ellesmere Island blown up again. And then in the southern part, we have the Stenkel Fjord. And on both sides, we have deposits of these early Eocene rocks. So right here and here. And while I was up there, I was able to find two fossil localities that I was able to census collect from. The first, which is known by the rather unenjoyable USPC 1014, is on the nose of this butte here. And this is from the eastern side of the fjord. And as you can see, it's this beautiful gray uh, siltstone that produces these, these just terribly beautiful black compression fossils. So we've got an elm leaf here. Here's a hazel. This is that extinct Archaeum pelos, an alder leaf. This is some type of birch leaf, maybe another hazel. There's that catsera tree. And then we have some unknown leaves. The other site, which is on the western side of the fjord, so right about here is where it is, was right at the top of this bluff. And it was from sediments that were sort of peeking out through the tundra and weathering away. And as you can see, the lithology is completely different. These terribly awful red colored rocks. And that's because these rocks, uh, and again, it was siltstone, so a very similar depositional environment, were filled with iron. So they're, they're rusting as they're exposed at the surface. And these are a bit harder to see, but again, we have the Katsura leaf. Here are some grape leaves. There's that Archaeum pellis, a horse chestnut here. Uh, there's that Maginatea, that sycamore relative. Usha, that, that Arctic oak that's not really an oak. And then other uh, birch-like or hazel-like leaves here. And what's interesting about these two localities is while we were up there, we were able to measure a complete geological section. And there's only two things you need to take away from this, this massive section here. One is that within the section, we have a radiometric date. So uranium lead dating from zircons was able to tell us that this point within the stratigraphy was approximately 53.7 million years ago. And this corresponds to one of those hypothermal events I talked about earlier. And this particular event is called the Eocene Thermal Maximum II. Right? So it was a fairly disruptive climatic event of the early Eocene. Below that, we have one fossil locality, the one with the beautiful black leaves, which we can simply refer to as pre-event. And then above that stratigraphically, so younger than the event itself, uh, we have those red leaves. So we can think of that as post-event. So the blue here corresponds to pre-event and the orange to post-event. So after conducting my census collections, we're able to look at the data. So in post-event, we had 317 specimens. And in pre-event, we had 207 specimens. When we look at the actual data itself, we can see some, uh, some patterns already jumping out of us. So we do have some uh, similarities in the types of plants. But there are certain plants that are unique to each locality. So the, this here is just indetermined. I haven't figured out what that leaf is yet. But you know the pre-event site has a few more indeterminate leaves than the post-event. The pre-event site has those katsura trees and a lot of elm leaves. The post-event is almost entirely dominated by the katsura tree, but we lost the elms entirely. And that left me wondering, is that perhaps related to the climatic event? And that's something I'm still studying, so I don't have a clear answer for you tonight. But what is interesting is that the flora definitely changed over time and potentially as a response to that climatic event. Now, you might be looking at the number of specimens here and saying, well, clearly the post event is going to seem uh, like it has more than one than another or potentially be seen as more diverse because there are more specimens. Well, we can actually deal with this. And our next step in our look at diversity 
is to rarify the samples. So in this slide here, uh, we're only looking at the dicots. We're not considering conifers or ferns. And that's simply based on how they enter the fossil record. Um, broadleaf taxa are much easier to count and to account for. So those are what we typically look at when we're assessing diversity in this way. And again, here for this rarefaction diagram, uh, we're again looking at dicots. And what it means to rarify is to simply take two samples of different sizes and to randomly sample them and build them up to their uh, maximal extent and then look back at the most minimal uh, locality. And of course, the pre-event only had 207 specimens. And if we look at the diagram only to here, we can see that the pre-event was more diverse. And I extrapolated uh, using statistics to find out had I been able to continue collecting, how, how many more uh, fossil plant types would I have found? And the curve suggests that at the very least, I would have gotten up to 13, maybe 14 taxa. And it looks as though it would have continued going up in that direction. Whereas post-event, it already appears to be uh, leveling off into this plateau. And I likely would not have found more than 11 or 12 different types of plants. Now, this gives us an indication that the diversity between the two sites is the same, even though the composition is different, but also that the pre-event was maybe just a little bit more diverse. And we can take this type of data and this type of analysis and take it a step further. And from here, we can compare it to modern forests. So I took a number of forests that were collected in the same way from the mid latitudes. So here's the harvest for Harvard Forest in Massachusetts, a forest from Gainesville, Honey Hill is in uh, North Carolina, and uh, as is Namikas Lake. So I rarified these against one another. And what we can see here is that these Arctic forests are actually approaching the diversity of a mid-latitude forest. So a forest between the, the 45 and, and 30 degrees of latitude. And that's actually quite interesting when we think about uh, what these forests must have been like uh, th during the early Eocene with the warm global climate and that far north. Now, the next step with that data requires us to think a little bit about what we call the latitudinal temperature gradient and the latitudinal diversity gradient. So the latitudinal temperature gradient is essentially how temperature diminishes over latitude. So if you think about the equator, the equator is a very warm uh, spot on the planet. And the further north or south you go, it get, gets progressively cooler. Well, how did this function during the early Eocene when it was much warmer? Well, the latitudinal temperature gradient was much shallower than it is today. And I was able to use climate data from my fossil plants to uh, calculate this temperature gradient. And it comes out to be about 0.28 degrees Celsius per one degree latitude. So this came from uh, roughly 48 degrees latitude north all the way up to 80 degrees north. Uh, so that gives you an extremely shallow gradient for northern North America. And the modern gradient is closer to 1.2 to 1.5 degrees Celsius per one degree latitude. Now, how this relates to the diversity gradient is that typically, again, when we think of an equatorial region, such as on this heat map here, uh, you have more diversity in your ecosystem. So if you think about the Amazonian rainforest and how it's often discussed as being so uh, biodiverse that you encounter a, a new species of some kind every few meters that you walk, um, that is the extreme example, and of course, it is a very warm environment. But the further north or the further south you go, that diversity begins to taper off. So if we look at the spindle diagram here, we find our maximal diversity near the equator. And then as we get further north or south, it decreases. And this, perhaps unsurprisingly, has a correlation to increasing temperature. The warmer it gets, the more diverse we get. Well. Let's look at that in practice for the early Eocene. So here are a number of uh, fossil sites from North America. So we have one from Republic, Washington, Falkland, BC, Maccabee, BC, and then Stenkel Fjord, the sites I was at on Ellesmere Island. And these sites all have climate data, uh, climate data associated with them. So mean annual temperature, 10 to 15, 
9 to 15, 9 to 15, 12 to 15. All right, they're all very similar in terms of temperature, but again, across a broad array of paleo latitudes. Mean annual precipitation, starting with the Arctic, 150 centimeters per year or more, 110, 120, 115. So the Arctic is a little bit wetter, but not by much. There's not too much difference between the precipitation uh, of the most southerly site and that of the most northerly site. So we have a fairly homogeneous climate, but when we look at the number of plant taxa that we find when we census collect, 58, 59, 40, 15, that's very strange. And remember earlier when I showed you this Whitaker biome diagram, the forests in BC, so Maccabee and Falkland, which are on this diagram, were also plotting as a temperate forest, the same as the Arctic forests. So with similar climate conditions prevailing throughout North America and the early Eocene, why do we not see this hyperdiverse or tropical style diversity all the way to the poles? Well, as I mentioned, the Eocene Arctic also experienced that extreme photic seasonality that is a feature of it today, 24 hours of darkness and 24 hours of light. And it's very likely that this photic seasonality was the limiting factor for diversity in the Arctic. And that's especially interesting because, as I mentioned in the previous slides, uh, the diversity gradient is assumed to be mechanistically controlled by and large by the temperature gradient. But in the Eocene, especially at high latitudes, temperature does, does not appear to be an overriding factor for the latitudinal diversity gradient at high latitudes. So what does this mean for the modern Arctic? Well, I'm still actually looking at this data and, and trying to untangle some of the more subtle elements of it. But ultimately, developing a greater understanding of paleoclimates in deep time during these globally warm intervals can provide us excellent information about our own modern Arctic and similar ecosystems as we move forward as our own climate warms. And of course, we have to ask ourselves the question, if the modern Arctic becomes warmer, will it become more diverse? Well, maybe, maybe not. The plants that live there today are well adapted to the cold environments and the photic seasonality, the 24 hours of darkness into 24 hours of light. And this light regime is an adaptation that is a difficult hill to climb. So potentially our warming climate might actually see the collapse of these ecosystems. But what, what we do know is that studying these fossil uh, ecosystems will help us learn more and more about how the high latitude environment functions in a warm world. So finally, let's just have a quick summary of some of the larger take home points here. Compositionally, we have a high taxonomic richness and they were functioning as temperate forest ecosystems. The climate was warm and wet and the precipitation was season, uh, seasonally equable, well distributed. And similar to the lower latitude uh, sites from uh, the early Eocene in British Columbia. Diversity was similar to a modern mid-latitude deciduous forest, and that diversity at high latitudes was moderated by the photic seasonality and not by temperature. Thank you all for listening.